The portrayal of Metroid Space Pirates has changed pretty significantly from one release to the next. Back in Super Metroid, the Space Pirates were these crustacean aliens with big snappy lobster claws for hands, crawling up and down the walls. It's actually a really cool sprite design. The Space Pirates of Metroid Prime are much more lizard-like. They have scaly green skin, reptilian faces, and three-fingered clawed hands. Something that's become clearer with the excellently redone models in the remaster is the way these Space Pirates have cybernetically altered themselves. Look at this Space Pirate's back. The way the metal has been crudely merged with its flesh. These space pirates are willing to undergo extreme and invasive surgeries to give themselves an edge in combat. Or perhaps their leaders are just willing to force their ground troops to do so. And it wasn't just the visual design that changed between games. Back in Super Metroid, the space pirates were pretty generically evil space aliens. They crawled around, they looked creepy, they shot lasers at you, and that's about it. There wasn't a lot of story to them. They didn't have much personality. They didn't have any motivation besides some vague desire to conquer the galaxy. The space pirates of Metroid and Super Metroid had no voice. They never spoke, never wrote anything down the player could read, never explained their motivations or their perspective. There are a lot of silent protagonists in video games, especially in the early days. Samus is one of them, she never speaks. And there are just as many silent antagonists too. The space pirates in Super Metroid were a silent antagonist. It's an interesting challenge to think about how a story gets told when both its protagonists and antagonists are silent. This changed in Metroid Prime. Metroid Prime has a scan visor with which the player can scan space pirate computer terminals. You can read their scientific notations, their security logs, orders issued from their high command, their journals, their aspirations, their frustrations, their fears. A lot has been said about how extraordinary the jump from 2D to 3D was in Metroid Prime. But I think this ability to scan space pirate text logs is just as extraordinary of a leap, but of a different kind. This is a narrative leap. In this game, the Space Pirates went from being a totally silent antagonist, with very vague motivations, no personality or culture to speak of, into an antagonist with a voice with a lot to say, with specific named motivations, into a defined alien culture whose societal values we could understand. It's a huge change. In Metroid Prime, you can read what the Space Pirates have to say about Samus, about the Metroids, about the Chozo, about Phazon, about their goals, in their own words, from their own perspective. From a narrative lens, this is a really extraordinary transformation. It's really fascinating. The writers had to take what tiny little bit of information they could glean about Space Pirates from those lobster claw sprites in Super Metroid, and blow it up into an entire alien intergalactic empire. Empire. So let's look at it. Let's examine how these space pirates are portrayed in Metroid Prime. How the writers brought them to life detail by detail. In Metroid Prime you can find and scan 25 logs which are labeled as pirate data. These 25 logs tell the story of the space pirates in their own words. In this video I will read all 25 of these logs, analyze each of them, examine what they tell us about the space pirates motivations, their culture, their society, what makes them tick, as well as examine each of these space pirate facilities we explore on the planet of Talon 4, and discuss a lot of other miscellaneous pirate related scans throughout the game. There are actually slightly different versions of these logs in different releases of the game, so just know that I am analyzing the log entries as they appear in Metroid Prime Remastered, as those tell the canon version of the space pirate story. In this video, I'm going to be analyzing a lot of very small, seemingly random details. Because the way the writers of Metroid Prime crafted the identity of the Space Pirates is by one small, seemingly random detail at a time, in scans from all over the game. What I want to do is combine all of those small details together into a cohesive picture of who the Space Pirates are. Anyway, the first pirate facility you will explore in Metroid Prime is the Research Frigate or 
Orpheon in orbit around the planet Talon IV. The Orpheon is an entire vessel dedicated to nothing but research, a science vessel. This is immediately interesting, because in Metroid and Super Metroid, anything pirate related you could find was combat or battle related. The Orpheon is the first time in the series when you see the pirates in a non-war footing, see something domestic in their culture, see them at home, so to speak. And its design already tells us a lot about that culture. You can learn a ton about a society from how they shape their spaces. The Orpheon's interior has a dark and comfortless design. There is very little color here, no plants, no artwork, no decoration anywhere in the visual design. Absolutely everything you see is functional in some way. It is factory-like. Every inch of this vessel is used for work. There is nothing extraneous, nothing recreational, nothing comforting. No life at all other than the space pirates themselves and the twisted results of their experiments. Immediately, you get the sense of a culture without much of what we would call culture. No art, no music, no literature. It's a very stark contrast to the Chozo culture you explore later, which is absolutely filled to the brim with art and ornamentation everywhere you look. But I'll do a full video on the Chozo later. Aboard the Orphan, on the space pirates conducted horrific experiments using a newly discovered mutagenic substance called Phazon. With Phazon, they forcefully mutate creatures into frightening new shapes, mutations that are painful, violent, and grotesque. These slithering parasite creatures you see here get morphed into this, this hulking, destructive, acid-belching leviathan. The space pirates' research is extreme. There is nothing careful or cautious about their research method. Their research modus operandi is to go as far as possible as fast as possible, with very little regard to safety or consequences. These are the sorts of scientists who never ask whether they should, only whether they can. It's a dangerous way to do things and has some predictable results. Just like Dr. Frankenstein's famous monsters, these space pirates have lost control of their creations. Their creations have turned against them. You can see one here that tore a gaping hole in the ship, slaughtering all in its path before finally being killed. By the time Samus arrives at the Orpheon, chaos reigns. The ship is in critical condition. Its horrific research subjects are on the loose, tearing holes in the ship's systems. All of the space pirate crew are fled, dead, or dying, fleeing from or slain by the results of their own experiments. Now, let's look at some scans on the ship. This set of scans discusses the mutations their experiment has undergone, and I want to pay particular attention to this one. Combat mutation applications are complete. This is the purpose of all their research. Combat. Conquest. War. The space pirates want to turn living creatures into weapons. As we read more of their scans, it will become clearer that this is the purpose of all their research. It's always about combat, it's always about getting an edge in the next battle, and we'll discuss that more in a bit. Next, this set of scans detail the mutation process, the injection of Phazon. This particular creature did not survive. This scan says, cell structure failing. The mutations were so drastic that they tore this creature apart at the cellular level. I think it's clear that this experimentation process is an extremely painful and often deadly one. I know they're just weird, ugly, alien parasite creatures, so we don't really care about them. And furthermore, it's a video game, and none of these creatures are real, so we care even less. But I think it's worth noting that the space pirates are subjecting living creatures to immense pain and suffering here. They are torturing these animals. It's genuinely horrific. These space pirates are depicted as a compassionless culture, willing to do anything in the name of scientific progress. This is science without ethical limitations. This is experimentation without any consideration for the well-being of the test subject. The Orpheon also contains our first pirate data log, the logs that tell the story of the space pirates in their own words, so here it is. Zebus has fallen. All ground personnel are presumed dead, either killed by the hunter class in metal or in the subsequent destruction of the underground facilities. Our research frigates Orpheon, Syracuse, and Volparagom were in orbit at zero hour and managed to retreat. Frigate Orpheon is now docked at Vortex Outpost. Orpheon's cargo appears to have a 100% survival rate. Metroids are healthy but on restricted feeding schedules due to uncertain supply status. We are ready to begin research on the Metroids and other promising life forms. Security status remains at Code Blue. 
blue, no signs of pursuit from the hunter. So Metroid Prime takes place directly after the original Metroid game. It's very early in the Metroid timeline. The planet Zebus was the site of a massive underground space pirate base, which Samus completely destroyed. From the space pirate perspective, this would be a traumatic and shocking event. A single person, a single bounty hunter, laid waste to an entire planet's worth of space pirates. All their technology, all their soldiers. For them, it must be nearly unbelievable. One thing I think is really interesting is seeing how the space pirates perceive Samus. Like, what is their view of her? What do they think of her? And the writers did a particularly good job answering that question. The space pirates refer to Samus as the Hunter, and I love this title. The Hunter comes with it an implicit sense of respect and fear. If she is the Hunter, then they are her prey. The space pirates aren't the kind of villains who shake their fists and say, We'll get you next time, loser. You just wait wait and see. Instead, they're like, that lady is freaking crazy. She is the hunter. We don't want anything to do with her. I really like this. As the player controlling Samus, reading this makes you feel powerful. Like, you guys should be scared of me. I'm kicking your butts. I also want to talk about that mention of the three research frigates, the Orpheon, Syracuse, and Volparagon. There's no discussion anywhere in this log of combat vessels, of battle frigates. Instead, it only discusses is their research frigates. The writers have changed the focus of the space pirates. Back in Super Metroid, the primary thing the space pirates did was crawl on the walls and shoot lasers. In Metroid Prime, the primary thing the space pirates do is research. Theirs is an intensely science-focused culture. Their fleet of ships is made up of research frigates rather than battle frigates. All of these space pirate facilities we explore in the game are research facilities, not combat-focused facilities, not military barracks, not military factories. They are full of research stations. Most of the scans you read in the game discuss these space pirates' experiments. I think this is really smart writing. Give your antagonist something to do besides fighting. And an interesting part of this is that, usually in fiction, the pursuit of knowledge, curiosity, scientific rigor, and scientific progress are depicted as noble traits. Very often we like and admire scientist characters in stories. However, However, within the space pirate culture, these usually noble traits have been twisted. In space pirates, science and industry, which can be so very beneficial and good, have been taken to their most violent, most destructive, most corrupting extreme. The space pirates use science to inflict pain and suffering, to torture, to destroy. As I mentioned earlier, the sole purpose of their research, of their curiosity, is to develop weaponry, to win battles, to become the supreme force in the galaxy. Power for power's sake. Space pirate culture is twisted and frightening. All the more so because they're good at it. These aren't a bunch of bumbling idiots. The space pirates are good scientists. Their experiments have real practical results. They are not afraid to take extreme risks. They are not afraid of catastrophic failure. Every time they fail, like on the Orpheon, they just pick up the pieces and start again right where they left off. This first log also contains the first mention of many Metroids in the game. The Orpheon used to have a full complement of Metroids for study, though by the time Samus shows up, they've been transferred onto the planet. The space pirates are obsessed with Metroids. This holds true through pretty much all of the games in the series. While in the games, Metroids tend to be fairly weak enemies, like you just have to hit them with an ice beam and then they're pretty much done. In the lore of the Metroid series, Metroids are supposed to be really, really scary. Metroids are essentially indestructible, with only only one weakness. You can freeze them, but most people don't have an ice beam like Samus does. If anyone else encounters a Metroid, you're basically already dead. You just can't kill them. The space pirates recognize the tremendous potential of the Metroids. If they could be harnessed, they could be a devastating weapon. Of course, throughout the series, no space pirate scientist ever succeeds in taming a Metroid, but that doesn't stop them from trying again and again. The space pirates possess an intrinsic tenacity. No matter how many times they fail, they just don't give up. Now, we're gonna move on from the research frigate Orpheon. Samus tracks down the last of the space pirates' escaped experiments, the Parasite Queen, and after defeating it in battle, 
it falls into the ship's energy core. Things start exploding and Samus escapes. Next, I want to talk a little bit about the Chozo. I'm gonna do a full essay on the Chozo's story in Metroid Prime later, but for now there's a couple things you need to know about them to better understand the space pirates. So the Chozo are an ancient intergalactic species, incredibly technologically advanced, but unlike the space pirates, the Chozo were deeply spiritually minded. They cared about art, they cared about nature, they cared about philosophy, they cared about harmony. In the story of Metroid Prime, the Space Pirates and the Chozo are foils to each other. They are the opposites of each other in almost every way. On Talon 4, the Chozo lived in spiritual and technological harmony with nature, until the planet was impacted by an apocalyptic extragalactic asteroid. The asteroid carried with it Phazon, the mutagenic substance the Space Pirates were experimenting with on the Orpheon. The Phazon spread throughout the planet, killing almost all life. In what little life it didn't kill, it transformed, mutated into hideous new forms. In their writings, the Chozo refer to Phazon as a poison. It is poisoning the planet, killing it. The Chozo tried to contain this poison. This difference in perspective between the Chozo and the Space Pirates is interesting to me. The Space Pirates recognize the poisonous qualities of Phazon. They know that it kills, that it mutates, but they aren't afraid of it. Instead, those exact qualities excite them. Where the Chozo see poison, the Space Pirates see potential. It's just like the Metroids, a terrifying and deadly species that are impossible to control. But because the Space Pirates are mad scientists willing to try anything, to experiment on anything if there is even the slightest combat potential, they will open Pandora's box. They will trip over themselves in their rush to pry open Pandora's box. They are so excited to unleash its devastating power, without any regard to whether they might be caught in its blast. The second Space Pirate facility you explore in the game is a very small one, located in the magma-filled Magmar Caverns. Here, the Space Pirates have constructed a geothermal power station. All over the caverns, you can see their technology siphoning liquid-hot magma from the pools, presumably shipping it off to their power generators. This facility is unique in that it is the only non-research-focused Space Pirate location in the entire game. And because it's not research-focused, it seems like the Space Pirates don't really care about it. It's small, and there aren't many actual Space Pirates around. There are a couple worthwhile scans here, though. First, this scan says that the local crystal formations don't contain much Phazon, but they do have a high value to the Monks of Grondheim, so this particular pirate recommends processing the crystal for that market once Phazon operations cease. This is the only mention in the entire series of the Monks of Grondheim, so I can't even guess who they might be. I'm pretty sure this is one of the only mentions of commerce in the entire series. The Metroid universe does not contain much mercantilism. The Space Pirates themselves are an oddly named antagonist. Even back in the original Metroid, they never do any real pirating. They don't act like pirates. Their goal is galactic domination, which isn't something historical pirates really cared about. Historical pirates wanted wealth and plunder. The Space Pirates never really seemed to care that much about money, except in this scan. Apparently, the Space Pirates sell things to the Monks of Grondheim, sometimes. I also think that line, once Phazon operations have ceased, is pretty funny. Phazon is the most extraordinary discovery the Space Pirates have ever made. Phazon operations are going to be the only kind of operations they will run for the entire Metroid Prime trilogy. But not all Space Pirates are on the same page. Down here in the geothermal power plant, there's some doofus Space Pirate who's like, oh, as soon as we're done with this Phazon stuff, we can sell some crystals to the monks of Grondheim. There's a second scan here that says, report any signs of magma predator activity to Security Central at once. The magma predator they're referring to is the Magmor, a sort of giant snake that lives in the magma and sprays fire. The reason Magmor activity is so dangerous is because it could damage those pistons that siphon magma from the pools, knocking the whole system offline. What interests me is that the Space Pirates are apparently having as much trouble with the local fauna as Samus is. Throughout the game, you can find a lot of scans like this, talking about infestations and security breaches by local predators. It just makes the world 
world feel a little more real. Realistically, the space pirates should be having difficulty with local predators. The fauna of Talon 4, because of Phazon mutation, is extremely dangerous. It also humanizes the space pirates a little bit. They're dealing with the same sorts of problems that we would deal with if we were trying to colonize a new planet. Moving on, the third space pirate facility you explore in the game is located in the Fendrana Drifts, the frigid polar region of Talon 4. Before you actually reach that facility, you can find a couple scans in the save room, and one of them is worth looking at. It says, new personnel must report to the South Research Facility. Failure to report will be penalized by a 30% ration cut and extra duty. This is the first mention in Space Pirate scans of punishment, and there will be many more. And it actually tells us a lot about Space Pirate society. Space Pirates can seem like a sort of monolith. Like all the Space Pirates share the same goal, the same drive, the same everything, but that isn't true. There is a hierarchy in Space Pirate society. There are those who give orders and those who follow orders. And sometimes, they don't follow those orders. The fact that a punishment exists at all suggests that sometimes pirates do things that require punishment. This may seem like a small and obvious detail, but it goes so far towards making the space pirates feel more real and alive. Back in Super Metroid, there's no suggestion that space pirates ever don't follow orders. In that game, space pirates might as well be mindless automatons, but in Metroid Prime, space pirates are sentient creatures, and sometimes sentient creatures are truant or disobedient or lazy. All of those foibles exist within space pirate culture too. It's also worth noting the form this punishment takes. Punishment means less food and more work. Just like us, these space pirates, or at least some of them, don't like doing work. They want to kick back and relax when their shift is over. They don't want to work extra shifts. This is another humanizing detail for what would otherwise be a totally faceless and mindless alien species. Scans mentioning punishment make me wonder about how labor is organized in space pirate society. Is service in the military optional or forced? Are the grunt Samus faces in battle volunteers, conscripts, or are they just straight up slaves? We never see any form of domestic or mercantile space pirate culture anywhere in any of the games, which suggests their society is very focused on the military. Most, if not all, industry, science, and labor works for the benefit of the military. Anyway, moving on to that third space pirate facility that's found in the Fendrana Drifts. The space pirate facility here is another research base, and it's actually located with in an old ruined Chozo facility. They've destroyed most of the architecture, replacing it with their own technology, burrowing and expanding. However, you can still see signs of the old Chozo structure here and there, like these towers at the top of the base, which are clearly Chozo in style. This is another interesting aspect of space pirate culture. They are willing to use anything that might benefit them, appropriate anything. If it's easier to occupy an old Chozo base than to build their own, then that's what they'll do. But they have no respect for what they're taking over. If another culture builds something that the space pirates find useful, they don't care at all about the culture that built it, only the product. They will think nothing of wiping out all the old gorgeous Chozo ruins on the planet, all of that culture and history, and keeping only what they can use. The Fendrana Drifts facility is the pirates' research headquarters on Talon 4, and most of that research seems to be focused on Metroids. It is located in the polar region because Metroids are weak to cold, and easier to control in cold environments. Just like on the Orpheon, the architecture here is very practical and undecorated. There is no decoration or recreation here, nothing designed for comfort. One thing that's interesting is how much ice and snow you can find inside the base. The space pirates care so little about comfort that they don't even properly seal the interior here. They are working in extremely cold temperatures. Of course, we don't know what temperatures these space pirates do find comfortable, but I still think it's notable how spartan the design is here. Next, let's look at some scans. Here are two scans related to their research. The first says, optimal absorption mutation has led to unexpected degeneration of internal organs. The second says, specimen euthanized after psychotic episode. These two scans speak further to how horrific the space pirate research methods are. Their experiments cause one animal's internal organs to dissolve, which must be horribly painful, and cause cause another animal to go violently insane to undergo a psychotic breakdown. Like what are they doing? 
to these poor animals. There's also this hollow observatory, which is really cool, and shows a holographic 3D model of the local system. One thing interesting to note is that apparently Zebus and Talon 4 orbit the same star, which is kind of confusing because where the heck are Talons 1 through 3? Anyway, according to this scan of the hologram, Talon 4's biosphere is collapsing. In approximately 25 years, it will be a barren wasteland. Phazon is killing the entire planet. The game mostly focuses on the way Phazon mutates creatures, but you should always remember that Phazon kills too. Phazon can and will destroy all life on the entire planet. This is scary stuff, and the space pirates don't care. The danger simply doesn't matter to them. The death of all life on a planet is inconsequential in their culture. The space pirates do not value life. They only value knowledge and domination. This one is a fun scan. All guards must use ice containment gear when transporting Metroids. This includes sedated specimens and those pronounced dead. There's a story here. At some point, a space pirate was transporting a Metroid they thought was dead, and then the Metroid jumped up and sucked their soul out of their face. Pretty terrifying. It also speaks to how loose these space pirate safety standards are. Alright, one final scan here before we get to the pirate data logs. Project Titan is suspended indefinitely. Security breaches resulting in massive casualties have occurred. Access is strictly prohibited. Project Titan was the space pirates attempt to pacify Thardis, this giant pile of rocks that have been brought to life by Phazon somehow. There are a few different scans that discuss the operation. This is so such a stupid thing to have tried to do. They were never going to pacify Thardis. He's not like a feral dog that you can domesticate. Again, he's literally just a bunch of floating rocks powered by Phazon energy. The space pirates just can't help themselves. They have to experiment on and subjugate everything. And again and again, it blows up in their face. Massive casualties. I guess at least in this case, the space pirates were smart enough to know when to give up, but I guarantee if Samus had never shown up and blasted Thardis to pieces, the space pirates would have given pacification another shot, and it would have gone just as poorly. Okay, so now we need to look at some space pirate data. Remember, pirate data are the narrative logs that tell the story of the space pirates in their own words. There are 25 pirate data entries in the game, and so far I have only looked at one of them. There are 12 here in the Fendrana Research Facility, so let's read each one and see what they tell us about space pirate culture. Scans of the spiral sector detected a massive energy spike emanating from a Wanderer class planet, identified as Talon 4. Scout reconnaissance was immediately dispatched to the center of the spike, a landmass at heading mark 40.08.02, returning with planetary samples and atmospheric imaging. Analysis shows the energy source to be an unstable radioactive material of enormous potential. We are unable to form an accurate risk assessment at this time but we are unlikely to find an energy source this powerful again. Analysis will continue, but currently Talon 4 appears to be a viable secondary headquarters. Following the destruction of their forces on Zebus, the space pirate scanners detected a massive energy spike. This was their first contact with Phazon. Like so many scientific discoveries, it was purely accidental. A random scan, right place at the right time. It's also interesting to me that, very soon after their defeat on Zebus, the space pirates are already launching straight into another expansion, colonizing a new planet. It seems as if any single defeat, even one as crushing as what happened on Zebus, barely slows them down at all. The space pirates have a deep reserve of forces with which to replenish themselves, following a defeat. We have codified the newfound energy source as Phazon, a V-index mutagen of which we have very little reliable data. Indications point to a meteor of unknown origin expelling Phazon into the environment. This material appears to possess the power to mutate organic life forms sufficiently to withstand its poison. These mutations appear promising, with abrupt evolutionary leaps appearing in single generation reproduction. Plans to establish a full science team on Talon 4 are being finalized. Here we see the naming of Phazon, though no explanation is given as to what the word means or why it was chosen. I want to focus on that phrase, these mutations appear promising. The mutations Phazon causes are horrific and violent. They almost always kill the creature being mutated. Phazon causes creatures to go violently insane. The space pirates' minds are so warped, they look at something this dangerous and say, oh, this seems promising. Like, these people are crazy. 
Phazon mining is underway. Several garrisons have been established, and terraforming of the Chozo ruins is underway. Security systems are operational, and Science Team continues to make progress in their biotech research. The Fendrana Drifts have proven to be an optimal location for research headquarters, and soon it will be joined by a fully operational combat base and starport. If Command's predictions are half true, we shall rise to dominance in this sector within a decacycle. Truly, these are glorious times. Alright, the Space Pirates are feeling pretty good. It's not clear how much time has passed since their total defeat on the planet Zebus, but it can't have been that long ago. And already, this Space Pirate is like, these are glorious times. We built a couple bases on an uncharted abandoned planet. Yeehaw! The science fiction nerd in me has always particularly loved this log. Just the idea of landing on an alien world, terraforming the surface, establishing outposts, conducting research, building a combat base in a starport. It sounds so cool. I would love to see a space pirate starport. It sounds awesome. If the space pirates weren't so freaking evil, they would actually be really cool. Like going to alien worlds, exploring, doing research. This is all what made Star Trek such a fun show. Initial transfer of Metroids to Tell and four research facilities has been completed. Three were terminated in an accident at the landing site, but the others were pacified and transported safely. Initial phase on infusion testing is underway. We are eager to observe the effects of phase on on Metroids, especially their ability to absorb and process the energy given off by phase on sources. Early research suggests a considerable growth in power and size. Whether the creatures stay stable thereafter remains to be seen. Here we see some more of the space pirate obsession with Metroids. Everything they do, they're like, well, what about Metroids? Sure, we've got this cool new toy, Phazon, but what if we mixed it with Metroids? Whoa! Like, guys, take a break. Go outside, go do something else. The very first creature they test Phazon on is Metroids. It's the first thing they do. If you gave a space pirate a jar of peanut butter, they would immediately go rub it on a Metroid to see what happens. It does speak to this insatiable curiosity that space pirates have. They want to understand things. They want to to see how this thing reacts to that thing. They always want to learn more. It would be a noble trait if it weren't in service of such terrible ends. Our initial tests exposing Talon 4's indigenous parasites to Phazon appear to be successful. Increases in strength, size, and aggressiveness are common in all test subjects, as well as unforeseen evolutions like additional poison sacs within the abdomen and the appearance of a second ring of mandibles in several subjects. These creatures were chosen because of their resilience, and it appears possible that that, given enough exposure to Phazon, they may one day be able to survive on any planet we transport them to. Our methods will have to be refined. We currently have a 100% extinction rate after the fourth infusion period, and most survivors of the third infusion stage are so violent and uncontrollable that they have to be euthanized. Even still, we remain hopeful that further experimentation will result in success. Okay, so in that first sentence, the space pirate says, our tests have been successful. And then later it says, we currently have a 100% extinction rate after the fourth infusion period, and most survivors of the third are violently insane. That is not success. If all of your research subjects are dead, then that is not a success. The pirates here are discussing the parasite queens they created up on the research frigate Orpheon. And of course we know that those experiments ultimately resulted in catastrophic failure, the complete destruction of the ship, along with almost all its crew. And here you can see exactly why that happened. The space pirates run a test, get hideous terrible results, and are like, wow, we're doing a great job, let's keep doing it. The space pirate research method is so insane. They take such absurd risks, and so often it results in catastrophic failure. Mining operations have begun near the crater where Phazon appears to be most concentrated. Daily Phazon yields have increased 44% and our mining system becomes more streamlined as personnel and equipment flows increase. Several incidents of phazon-induced madness have been reported, prompting augmented life support regulations in the deeper chambers. Symptoms include loss of equilibrium, erratic respiration, muscle
muscle spasms, and in the most extreme cases, hallucinations. A timeline reassessment for the refinery operations is recommended, as the material proves more unstable than initial analysis indicated. This is the first mention in the series of Phazon Madness, which by Metroid Prime 3 will become central to the plot. Phazon can affect your mind cause you to see things that aren't there, can make you go violently insane, and there is no cure. Once you are affected by Phazon Madness, there is no going back. Your mind will be forever altered. You'd think that if the way Phazon poison and kills all life it touches, or the hideous mutations it causes weren't enough to scare the space pirates away, then this would do it. Like, how many more red flags do you need? How many more signs do you need that this stuff is really dangerous and should not be played with? Of course, the space pirates barely care. This log contains no concern for the well-being of their workers. The only thing they care about is how this mental illness will affect their refinery operation timelines. Space Pirate Society is ruled by a horrifying bureaucracy that truly does not care about its workers. The only thing it cares about is timelines and results. Later on, we will see just how cruelly these poor workers who are infected by Phazon Madness get treated. Research Outpost Glacier 1 in the Fendrana Drifts region of Talon Forest Mountains is operating at 85% capacity. Sub-zero temperatures have made the Metroid sluggish and easy to control, even those well into phase-on infusion cycles. Cold containment stasis tanks are sufficient for the juveniles, but some of the larger Metroids have been moved to quarantine caves for safety purposes. Security doors remain an issue, as malfunctions due to ice occur every day. Large predators in the wastes are also a concern, as they continue to kill personnel and breach secure areas. Unfortunately, it has become clear that our containment teams cannot neutralize all of them without a vast increase in munitions and soldiers. Glacier One is the name of this research facility we've been exploring. As previously mentioned, the focus here is on Metroid research, which is aided by cold temperatures. There's also more talk of these space pirates' problems with local wildlife. That last line, we cannot neutralize all of them without a vast increase in munitions and soldiers is interesting to me because it's kind of an admission of failure. The space pirates cannot overcome the local wildlife. The space pirates are not some monolithic insurmountable force. They are getting beat by beetles and shriek bats. Also, that mention of personnel getting killed. Even before Samus shows up, the casualty rate of this mission was already really high. Just how many people have these space pirates lost on Talon 4 before Samus ever stepped foot on the planet? Most are farming and retrofitting of security checkpoints on Talon 4 is complete, but we continue to research the alarming epidemic of breaches by local creatures. Door records show no unauthorized entries, so we must presume the creatures are either slipping in undetected, during daily personnel moves, or else finding their way in through subterranean tunnels. We have found many small breaches of this latter sort, and plug them whenever we can, but it is unlikely that we will ever achieve full extermination within our current timetable. This is more discussion of the Space Pirates' failure to overcome the local wildlife. They're having some serious problems. I haven't pointed out all the extraneous scans, but they talk about this over and over again. They just cannot beat these big beetles. I mentioned it before, but it's worth repeating. It's details like these that make the world of Metroid Prime feel more alive and more real. The Space Pirates are dealing with realistic problems. These are the kinds of difficulties they should be facing on a planet like Talon 4. I really admire the writing and world building in this game. The reconstruction of Geoform 187, codenamed Ridley, was recently completed. After his defeat on Zebus, Command ordered a number of metagenic improvements for him. Though aggressive, we were able to implement these changes in a cycle. The metamorphosis was painful, but quite successful in the end. Early tests indicate a drastic increase in strength, mobility, and offensive capability. Cybernetic modules and armor plating have been added as well. We believe our creation, now called Meta Ridley, will become the mainstay of our security force, a job he will certainly relish. This is one of the only scans that mention Ridley, Samus' longtime nemesis in the game. In Super Metroid and Metroid Zero Mission, Ridley is portrayed as a leader of the Space Pirates, even as sort of general, commanding troops. In Metroid Prime, he has been reduced to Geoform 187, just one of, apparently, nearly 200 other equally interesting Geoforms. It's a bit of an unfortunate fall from grace for the Space Dragon, and lore-wise doesn't really fit in with the rest 
of the series. Samus first encounters Ridley on board the Orpheon, where he was recovering after his cybernetic surgery. She chases Ridley down onto the planet. Nominally, this is Samus's mission in the game. It's not given much attention, but Samus is technically searching for Ridley for the entire game. Like, that's why she's exploring the planet. She's looking for him. He disappears for basically the entire game until he randomly shows up for an awesome boss battle at the very end. Confidence is high regarding Phazon applications. We know enough about Phazon now to begin combining it with Space Pirate DNA. The code name for this venture will be Project Helix. Preliminary studies indicate that Phazon infusion could produce radical new pirate genomes. Benevolent mutation levels are high in current test subjects. Phazon madness is a concern, but refinements in the infusion process should reduce or neutralize the odds of mental degeneration. The space pirates are not only conducting horrific and torturous experiments on animals, but they have begun conducting horrific and torturous experiments on themselves. This is legitimately crazy. We have seen the results of the space pirate experiments with Phazon, the destructive, violent, uncontrollable parasite queens that destroyed the Orpheon. Scans have mentioned a 100% fatality rate, meaning every single research specimen was killed by the experiments. Scans have mentioned violence so terrible that specimens had to be euthanized. Scans have mentioned Phazon Madness. There was Project Titan, the attempt to subdue Thardis, and the massive casualties that resulted there. Every single one of the Space Pirates experiments with Phazon has resulted in complete failure. All they've really accomplished is inflicting pain and suffering on these creatures, and now they're going to do it to themselves. There's even a stasis tank in the Glacier 1 facility, where you can see the results of these experiments. It's just a bunch of pieces of meat. This Space Pirate was completely destroyed. Space pirate culture is willing to risk anything for scientific results. They are willing to sacrifice anything, even their fellow space pirates. We'll get some more information later detailing exactly how this research is being conducted, and that will provide us with a lot more information concerning how space pirate society is organized. Metroid Dissection continues to provide more questions than answers. Our research teams have isolated the energy conduits that run from the invasive twin mandibles to the energy core in the creature's quadripartite nucleus, but the manner in which a Metroid actually extracts the life force from its prey remains an utter mystery. The victim does not lose blood or any other vital fluids, and yet the Metroid extracts energy. Identifying this energy is our central problem. It takes no physical form, and yet without it, the victim dies. We will continue to research this matter, as the isolation of this life-giving essence could be the key to our ascendance. More Metroid Metroid obsession. I believe the suggestion here is that Metroids are literally sucking out their victims' souls? I don't know what else this mysterious life-giving energy could be. So yeah, if a Metroid latches onto you, they will eat your actual spiritual soul. Pretty scary. Studies of Metroid biology continue, though with limited progress. It seems likely that we will be much more successful using the Metroids for our means, rather than trying to reproduce their powers. If they could be adequately tamed, we would have no need of a proper understanding of their metabolism. A small force of disciplined Metroids could wipe out entire armies, and once we find a way to shield them from cold containment weapons, they will be invincible. Furthermore, if we could then harvest the energy they'd consumed, we would have a near limitless source of power at our disposal. The hubris of the Space Pirates is incredible at times. They couldn't tame the Space Pirates. They couldn't tame the Parasite Queens. They couldn't tame Thardis. They can't control Phazon. But now they're like, oh yeah, we can definitely control the Metroids. That won't blow up in our faces like literally every single one of our other experiments. Oh yeah, let's make cold resistant Metroids that literally can't be killed. That would be awesome. I cannot foresee any terrible consequences there. I guess if there's one thing you can say about the Space Pirates, it's that they are dreamers. They dream big. They look at an impossible situation and they see possibilities. There is an almost unbelievable optimism to these logs. They have no reason to be optimistic about any of this. They have failed again and again, and yet they really seem to believe that they can still accomplish these things. In spite of how horrific their actions are, there is something admirable in the space pirate's psyche, a tenacity and idealism. They just don't give up. They never doubt themselves. Their confidence is never shaken. Anyway, that was the last pirate data log
catalog in the Fendrana Drifts, so now we need to move on. Before we discuss the final space pirate facility in the game, I want to take a quick detour over to the Chozo Artifact Temple. This is an ancient Chozo structure, floating over the Phazon Asteroid Impact Crater. The temple itself generates an energy shield that is containing most of the Phazon in the crater, though enough Phazon is still leaking out to poison the planet. As we'll see, this energy shield becomes a source of major frustration for the space pirates. It is preventing them from accessing the crater and that makes them very upset. Anyway, the main reason for this detour is that there is one pirate data log located here, so let's look at it. Field team reports are in on an age structure of alien design built on the surface of Talon 4. Studies show this structure projects a containment field. This field bars access to a prime source of energy within a deep crater. Science team believes the field is powered by a number of strange Chozo artifacts. We have found some of these relics and studies on them have begun. As this this field could hinder future energy production operations on Talon 4, we must dismantle it as soon as possible. If this means the destruction of the Chozo artifacts, it will be done. For now, I really just want to point out the willingness of the space pirates to destroy these ancient alien artifacts. These are objects of immense cultural and technological value, and the space pirates are like, yeah, let's just blow them up. I've talked a lot about how practical and comfortless these space pirate architectural designs are. You might think, well, these are military facilities. Of course, they're going to be practical instead of pretty. Maybe these space pirates have more elaborate architecture back home. I think this willingness to destroy these artifacts suggests otherwise. Space pirate society places no value on culture or history. For them, something's value is measured by its usefulness. Art and music have no place in a society like this one. Anyway, now we need to move on to the final pirate facility we explore in the game. The Phazon Mines. The Phazon Mines are the main base of the Space Pirates on Talon 4. It is a sprawling, layered complex, dug deep into the planet's crust. Here, the Space Pirates have had a lot of time to build up their industry, their technology, to set up their weapon and defense systems. They are dug in. This isn't like the Glacier 1 facility in the Fedrana Drifts, where they occupied a Chozo ruin. The Phazon Mines are almost purely a Space Pirate facility. The visual design matches what we've seen elsewhere. Practical, comfortless, spartan, undecorated. I've always felt like the color palette here is a bit sickly looking. Like, look at how green and full of life the Talon Overworld is. And then look at how lifeless and brown the Phazon Mines are. As the name implies, there's a lot of Phazon here. It's all over the place. On the walls, on the ground. The Space Pirates appear to have done very little to shield their facility from this dangerous substance. Phazon is really, really dangerous. It can poison you, kill you, mutate your DNA, cause you to go insane. And here it is, just all over the place in the Space Pirates' main headquarters. This does have consequences. You can find scans discussing Space Pirate workers going insane, getting sick, dying. It actively harms their operations. But they care so little about safety. Not only do these Space Pirates not value culture or art, they absolutely do not value the lives of their workers. Space pirate culture is industry, science, and unfeeling bureaucracy, taking to a terrifying extreme. Also, since this is their headquarters, that means there are going to be a lot of scans for us to look at, so let's get started. This is a fun one. Report all Phazon mutations to science team immediately. All units with useful mutations will receive an increase in pay and rations. Not only are the space pirates doing nothing to shield themselves from Phazon's effects, but they are actively trying to get themselves accidentally mutated. And if you have a so-called useful mutation, you'll actually get more food and money. Imagine how sad you would be to get a not useful mutation. Like, not only do I have a giant grotesque tumor growing out of my face because of the unsafe working conditions in the irradiated phase on mines, but I don't even get any extra french fries at lunch for it. Also, I would really like to know some examples of useful mutations. Like, if I grew a second arm would I get paid more? Security alert, all stations. Biofarm Samus Aaron has made Planetfall on Talon 4. The hunter is among us. All units are hereby ordered to attack Aaron on site. Terminal force is authorized. I really like this scan, because it shows us the space pirate's first reaction to the arrival of Samus. There's a bit of an oh shit tone to this scan. 
Like, oh my gosh, she's here. After the destruction of Zebus, imagine how scary this would be. Samus is coming to destroy you. The space pirates take her very seriously. There's an implicit respect. There is no arrogance in this scan. They know she's a threat. They know she can destroy them. Attention all units. Report to your battle stations. Failure to comply with this order is an act of treason. Treason is punishable by termination. There are so many mentions of punishment in Space Pirate scans. They must have a pretty serious obedience problem. There wouldn't be this many mentions of punishment if grunts were always just blindly following orders. It's evidence of some serious unrest and dissatisfaction within their ranks. Also, that mention of treason in termination is pretty brutal. Go get killed by Samus or we will kill you ourselves. The lowest ranking Space Pirates are in a tough spot. No matter what, they get killed. Makes me feel kind of bad for them. A shipment of military-grade plasma artillery cannons is en route to Talon 4. The Edgenoid Star Marines we acquired them from were letting it sit in a warehouse. Our elite pirates will soon put them to good use. This scan is interesting to me because it informs us that not all of the space pirate weapons are their own. These cannons the elite pirates wield in battle were stolen from something called the Edgenoid Star Marines. The space pirates are often presented as hyper-technologically advanced scientists and weapons manufacturers who produce some really terrifying weapons. But also, it turns out, they're just thieves. They let someone else develop cool technology and then they steal it. It makes me wonder how much of the space pirate equipment we see them fight with in-game was actually stolen from someplace else. Maybe this is where the pirate in their name comes from. They don't steal plunder and booty, they just steal technology. I think this is a fun idea, like if for all their curiosity and scientific research, the space pirate scientists don't actually produce many real results. Instead, their soldiers fight in battle with a jumbled makeshift mix of stolen gear and weapons. Security level Tau will be in effect until further notice. All leaves cancelled pending downgrade of alert status. This one is interesting to me because it mentions military leave. The space pirate military grunts aren't mindless drones, who serve 24-7 without rest. Just like human soldiers, space pirate soldiers need some R&R &R every now and then too, and they get it. I always wonder about where these space pirates go when they're on leave. Do they get to leave the planet, go home, and visit their families? Or is there some kind of R&R &R facility on Talon 4 that we never see? What do space pirates do when they're on break? Do they have games, books, movies? I'd be curious to see. Phazon infested fungal harvesting continues. Replacement of Dika Triticale with Phazon infused fungal matter in Elite Ration mix has been authorized. This is one of those little world building details that I really like. One of the most basic questions in world building is, what do they eat? Anytime you're writing a fantasy or science fiction setting, you should ask yourself that question. What do your characters eat? It's a detail that gets missed a lot, and it's not some small detail. Food, what we eat, is really central to our lives. How much time do most of us spend eating or thinking about eating? A fantasy or a science fiction setting with no food is a hollow setting. So what do space pirates eat? Well, the elites were eating triticale, which is a type of wheat, but now they're going to be eating phazon mushrooms. You can actually see the giant blue glowing phazon mushrooms that the space pirates are growing in these quarantine caverns. Planetary stealth technology is back online. We have evaded detection by the battle cruiser Emmons. The brief lapse in planetary security caused by the crash is over. Apparently, these space pirates have some kind of stealth field that covers the entire planet, masking their presence. This suggests to me that the space pirates aren't actually very strong. They have to hide. If the Federation finds they're still developing Operation on Talon 4, they might not be able to defend themselves. They are afraid of a single battle cruiser passing through the system. This might explain why Samus, a lone bounty hunter, is able to defeat them. There really aren't that many space pirates. It's also interesting that the crash of the Orpheon disrupted the stealth field. I wonder if the Orpheon itself
himself was contributing to the stealth field in some way. Okay, so this next scan is completely hilarious. Recon teams are searching for the Hunter's gunship. Science team believes it employs a sophisticated cloaking device beyond our capabilities. Aside from dumb luck, we may never discover its location. This is ridiculous. This is Samus's gunship. The Orpheans crash site is right over there. Like, it's a 30 second walk away. The space pirates have flying troops at the crash site. All they need to do is fly 20 feet away and they would immediately find her gunship. I guess the suggestion is that this supposed cloaking device makes it invisible to these space pirates while remaining visible to Samus, but I think it's more fun to imagine that it's just sitting here out in the open, and these space pirates are too stupid to find it. Test results from battle simulation Samus Aran are promising. Elite units report a 74% success rate against Aran in testing. This is also hilarious, because I have a 100% success rate in kicking those elite pirates big mutated butts. Their Samus Aran battle simulation must totally suck if it's getting beat by these guys. The elite pirates are pathetic. The normal troopers do more damage than these guys. This scan also speaks to how scared the space pirates are of Samus. Every time they develop a new weapon, they probably test it against their Samus Aran battle simulation. Protecting themselves from her must be one of their highest priorities. Increase bomb patrols in authorized areas. This is a tiny detail, but I find it to be really interesting. The bamboos are these energy beings you encounter various times throughout the game. I thought these were just random indigenous creatures on Talon 4, but apparently not. These energy creatures are actually deployed by the space pirates to protect their bases. Again, I recognize that this is a tiny detail, but I like that it explains why there are bamboos in the space pirate facilities. These next two scans show just how brutal the space pirate mindset is. The first set an entire shift of dynamo workers have been transferred, following bouts of phase on madness. Units have reported to science team for use in laboratory studies in the new elite pirate program. Their dementia will make them adequate training adversaries for the elite team. Okay, so the dynamo is the central energy dynamo that powers the entire space pirate operation on Talon 4 because of the unsafe working conditions here. All that exposed Phazon on the walls and the ground. An entire shift of workers have gone insane. And after going insane as a result of poor working conditions, their superiors send them to go die in combat training against the elite pirates. Like, where the heck is space pirate OSHA? This is not acceptable. This is so brutal. First, through our negligence, we're gonna let you get sick. Then once you're sick, we will kill you to train our spiffy new mutant soldiers. And this is so short-sighted. Space Pirate Command is only hurting itself. When you reach the Dynamo, your scans tell you that it is in desperate need of maintenance, and should be taken offline immediately. The reason it is in desperate need of maintenance is that all of its workers are dead or sick with Phazon Madness. By not taking care of their workers, the Space Pirates shoot themselves in the foot. The second scan here says, The keeping of pets has been suspended until further notice. Domestic beasts have been deemed highly susceptible to Phazon Madness, and are thereby a hazard to personnel. All Gronkats and Old Baps must be disposed of immediately. Failure to comply will result in the loss of pay for a cycle, and reduced rations. Firstly, that Space Pirates keep pets is huge information. It completely changes how I view them. This one little detail goes so far to humanizing them, and making them feel more real. The Space Pirates have freaking pets. The Space Pirates aren't just cold, unfeeling aliens who spend all their time scheming to conquer the galaxy. They seek companionship. They have grand cats and old baps. I asked earlier, what do space pirates do in their free time? Well, here's one answer. They take care of their pets. This scan is also deeply sad. Imagine if your boss came to you and said, hey, you have to dispose of your dog or cat, or we won't pay you anymore. Like, go screw yourself, dude. We've seen the space pirates do a lot of horrible things, but this feels like one of the worst ones to me. Forcing someone to dispose of their beloved pet is genuinely terrible and heartless. These space pirates suck, man. They're bad dudes. 
Alright, but those are just a few of the miscellaneous scans you can find in the Phazon mines. We still need to look at the pirate data logs here. There are 12 more pirate data logs in the Phazon mines, so let's look at each one and see what they tell us about space pirate culture and society. Security Command issued an all points alert after the fall of Zebus. The alert concerns Bioform Samus Aaron, also known as the Hunter. Subject is a female hominid and is heavily armed and extremely dangerous. Subject uses a powered armor suit of unknown design in battle, along with a number of potent beam and concussive weapons. All combat units are instructed to terminate Aaron on sight, preferably in a fashion that will allow salvage of her powered armor suit and weapons. A considerable bounty will go to the unit who delivers Aaron to command, dead or alive it matters not. What's interesting to me here is how little the space pirates actually know about Samus. I'm not sure if they even know that she's human. They use the term hominid, which is a generic term that can apply to any bipedal primate. There are probably a lot of hominid alien species in the Metroid universe. They don't know anything about her armor suit, don't realize that it is a Chozo design, they don't know anything about her weapons. Samus herself knows the space pirates very well, they killed her family. She hunts them down in revenge. I think from the space pirate's perspective, Samus might just be some person who randomly showed up out of nowhere and started blowing up all their stuff and they have no idea why. They don't realize that they have a past history with her. They have no clue what's happening. We also see in that log the space pirates continued obsession with knowledge and learning. They want Samus's armor suit. They don't just want to destroy her, they want to dissect her technology, learn from it. Initial project Project Helix experiments with space pirate embryos were disastrous. The phazon infusion process degenerated brain tissue even as it augmented muscle mass. None of what we have termed elite pirates lived to maturity. The few that survived their infanthood suffered severe psychotic breakdowns as juveniles, killing anything within their zone of perception. Research team Sclera made a recent breakthrough, in which parasite studies with a phazon strain codenamed Vertigo were highly successful. Since then, we have successfully fused Vertigo Phazon with Space Pirate DNA with great success. The latest batch of Elite Pirates have reached maturity successfully and are ready for field testing and training. This is a continuation of an earlier log. The Space Pirates are experimenting with Phazon and Metroid DNA. I didn't pay close attention to this log the first time I played, so I always assumed they took an adult Space Pirate, poked him with Phazon needles, and that's how they made Elite Pirates, but that's not correct. They're actually experimenting with embryos. They are growing new species of space pirates. You don't mutate into a Phazon-infused elite pirate. You are born a Phazon-infused elite pirate. This brings up a whole slew of other questions for me. How often do space pirates experiment with their embryos? How many pirates have purely natural births? We know that space pirates are willing to drastically augment their bodies with invasive cybernetics. What if that process starts before they're even born? born. Is it possible that space pirates twist and craft and shape their young starting at the embryonic stage? We also know that space pirates are a hierarchical society. How might that combine with embryonic genetic modification? Do they craft leaders for themselves? Do they genetically modify a certain cast of space pirates to be smarter, more organized, more ruthless than their fellows? Why not every role in their society then? I know I'm making a lot from a small detail here, but I don't see any reason why the space pirates wouldn't genetically craft scientists for society, soldiers, generals, engineers, slaves, if they have the technology. In a science and order obsessed hierarchical society like these space pirates, I think it makes perfect sense that your role would be genetically decided for yourself before you are even born. Investigations into a possible ingress point for the impact crater continue to meet with failure. The shield of strange energy that protects it is in permeable, and all attempts to tunnel past it have proven fruitless. Our continued futility in this matter is made all the more significant, in light of the recent life form readings 
readings we've discovered emanating from deep within the crater. Analysis of the readings indicate that a massive creature is gestating there, absorbing enormous amounts of phazon from the phazon core at the heart of the impact crater. This discovery makes accessing the crater doubly important. Not only will it open the door to vast deposits of phazon within, but it will also lead us to this creature, whatever it may be. The space pirates have detected Metroid Prime, the final boss of the game, and their immediate response is, we gotta get it. This is so crazy to me. The space pirates failed with the Parasite Queen, failed with Thardis. Both of those experiments with giant mutated monsters ended in catastrophic failure. Now they've detected another giant mutated monster, and they say, let's go get it, boys. The space pirates are so consumed by their need to know, to understand, to control absolutely everything, that they cannot stop themselves from making the same mistake over and over. If they ever actually did encounter Metroid Prime, it would end in disaster. Actually, in the original version of the game, the space pirates did capture Metroid Prime. Those logs have since been changed in more recent versions. It was changed because it didn't make sense story-wise how Metroid Prime could both be in the core of the impact crater, which was sealed by the Chozo Artifact Temple, and also in the Space Pirates' possession at the same time, so they changed it. Predictably, in that older version, Metroid Prime escaped killing a bunch of space pirates on her way out. Science team is attempting to reverse engineer Samus Aran's arsenal, based off of data acquired from her assaults on our forces. Progress is slow but steady. Command would dearly enjoy turning Aran's weapons against her. We believe we can implement beam weapon prototypes in three cycles. Aran's power suit technology remains a mystery, especially the curious morph ball function. All attempts at duplicating it have ended in disaster. Four test subjects were horribly broken and twisted when they engaged our morph ball prototypes. Science team wisely decided to move on afterward. I feel so sorry for those four test subjects. Like those poor guys who were selected to test out whatever horrific contraption the space pirate scientists created that mimicked the morph ball got some of the rawest deals of anyone in the series. Imagine your body being twisted and crushed into a little ball shape. Imagine how how painful that would be. The space pirates do not care about the health or well-being of their test subjects. There is no consideration for their safety. Like, just test it on something else first. Don't jump straight to testing your mad scientist ball execution device on living people. I do like that they're pointing out how crazy the morph ball is. There's no reason why this thing should work. Scientifically, it makes no sense. A human being cannot turn into a ball. It's freaking crazy. Elite Pirate Upsilon's propensity for Phazon has enabled our research team to infuse it far beyond our safety restrictions, and the results have been extremely encouraging. Its constant Phazon diet has increased its mass exponentially, but it has retained all mental faculties and shows dexterity with all elite weaponry, including plasma incendiary launchers and the chameleon manta issued for cloaking purposes. Elite Pirate Upsilon exhibits miraculous healing abilities. When injured, it seeks out Phazon deposits and coats itself in the substance, which instantly mends the creature's wounds. The subject, which we are codenaming Omega Pirate based on these developments, shows potential to be a new standard for our armies. Our only concern at this point is its potential overdependence on Phazon. This is the first mention of the Omega Pirate, which is by far the most difficult boss fight in the game. This particular scan is largely for gameplay purposes. It details some of a future boss's weaponry and abilities, so the player can be better prepared when they face it in battle. Story-wise, there's not much here, other than further evidence of their scientists' willingness to go to extremes. As we continue to observe the development of Project Helix's Elite Pirates, it becomes increasingly obvious that these warriors will usher in a new era of space pirate dominance. They are incredibly resistant to damage, and their ability to transport and wield so many weapons at once makes them the ideal mainstays of our ground forces. Though they are not as quick as typical pirates, it makes a little difference. With a platoon of elite pirates in the vanguard of an army of normal and flying pirates, Pirates, we will have a near indestructible backbone that should turn the tide of any engagement. This log speaks more to that almost unbelievable space pirate optimism I've talked about before. There's something admirable about it. These space pirates, no matter how many times
times they've failed, no matter how many times Samus has walked in and effortlessly wrecked all their shit, they are still so certain they will ultimately attain total success. As someone who has failed a lot in his life, it's kind of inspiring. I think this optimism is central to space pirate identity. They truly believe in themselves and their mission. This is why they are so relentless. This optimism explains why, in the face of crushing defeats, the space pirates do not give up. Analysis continues on these cursed ruins in the Chozo Temple that hovers near them. We are now completely certain that the containment field denying us access to the impact crater is linked to strange artifacts that belonged in the temple, but we are no closer to finding them or deciphering the riddles that seem to cover every wall of this ruined place. Command grows increasingly anxious for a resolution to this matter, so we must redouble our efforts. X-ray squadrons will begin terrain sweeps within days. Until they begin, patrols are instructed to report any and all architectural anomalies to their commanders. I'm gonna skip right past this one, because it's very closely linked with the next log, and it makes more sense to discuss them both together. We have come to another dead end. It is clear now that we will never discover the locations of the Chozo's artifacts, until we can discover the messages carved into these statues in this abominable temple. Our language databases are woefully inadequate, and our linguistic analysts can come up with little more than vague theories. The best hypothesis we can offer is that finding artifacts will require items spiritually linked to the Chozo civilization. However, without these items, we are lost, and Command grows more impatient by the day. Results must be produced soon. The most interesting thing to me in these two logs, and the most revealing detail about space pirate culture, is that they are completely incapable of deciphering this alien language. Now, why is that? Why can't they decipher the Chozo language? We've seen that these space pirates are obsessed with knowledge, with research and experimentation, that they have an intrinsic cultural curiosity, that they want to find out everything about a subject that they can. Their scientific ability are impressive. They've created some pretty cool stuff. But the space pirates don't treat all knowledge as equal. They don't want to know everything about everything. They only want to know what will help them in battle, what will further their quest for galactic dominance. They want to know about technology, about engineering, about weapons, about energy. They don't care about linguistics. For them, studying languages is pointless. Being multilingual won't aid them on the battlefield. In space pirate society, linguistics Linguistics is a neglected field of study, and this neglect hurts them, because they can't translate the Chozo language, they cannot complete their mission on Talon IV. Curiosity is central to space pirate culture, but that curiosity is hyper-focused on a narrow band of topics. Results are in from field studies on the bioform group Chozo, who we believe are extinct. We believe that Talon IV was once a stronghold in a great Chozo empire, brought low by the meteor strike. Planetary devastation brought an end to the Chozo, yet remnants of their society remain. We are studying these relics in an attempt to harness their power. What is of no use to us, we destroy. In time, we shall have all we need from this dead race, and shall wipe this planet clean of their ugly ruins. The dead should serve the living, not hinder them. This always seemed like one of the most horrific logs in the game to me. I am someone who is obsessed with history and culture. I think there is so much that we can learn from history in ancient cultures, especially extinct ones. These sorts of historical ruins should be preserved as meticulously as possible so we can continue to learn from them, to be able to continue to appreciate ideas that were formulated in another age, from a culture totally alien to our own. And then these space pirates are just casually destroying the Chozo ruins for no reason just because they're assholes. Like, what the heck? Leave the ruins alone, you jerks. I think we should also look at this from Samus's perspective. She has a relationship with the Chozo. As an orphan, she was raised and trained by the Chozo. She wields Chozo-designed weapons in battle. How might she feel on reading this log? How might she feel when she learns that the space pirates are destroying their remains? No wonder Samus hates them. Although we are still no close to finding the artifacts of the Chozo, we have at least produced a viable hypothesis for their function. It appears that each of the artifacts corresponds to one of these statues on the platform. 
and that each one acts as a small key to a huge lock. Judging by the number of statues, we assume there must be 12 artifacts. Once we find the resting spots of all 12, we can bring them here, unite them with their statues, and open the gate system at long last. Once we do, the impact crater and whatever creature it shelters will be ours for the taking. This log is another gameplay consideration. It's explaining a gameplay mechanic. The player has to collect all 12 artifacts to act access the impact crater. This is very important information, since without it you can't beat the game. So the developers wanted to communicate it to the player in a few different places so you're less likely to miss it. It's good game design but not very relevant to this analysis. There have been numerous incidents involving spectral entities at Chozo Ruin sites. Several personnel have been assaulted by these Chozo ghosts. Few have survived. Survivors speak of swift attacks from nowhere, brief sightings of the enemy, then nothing, only to be followed by another attack. Science team believes these attacks are in response to our efforts to recover Chozo relics and artifacts. Somehow, these entities are able to interact with the physical world, and it appears they wish to keep their artifacts for themselves. We will make them pay for such arrogance. Even ghosts can be destroyed. This is the 25th and final pirate data log in the game. It discusses the Chozo ghosts, which are something I'm going to talk a lot about in a future video focused on the Chozo story. But it isn't hugely relevant to an analysis of the space pirates. From a writing perspective, I do really like that this log gives us a look at the Chozo ghosts through space pirate eyes. From their perspective, the ghosts are really scary. Flitting in and out of sight, swift and deadly attacks from nowhere. Any log or scan that gives us some insight into the space pirate experience of this world is, I think, worthwhile. But that's it. That's the last log and the last scan we're going to look at in this video. That's all the information about Space Pirate Society and Space Pirate Culture the game provides us with. So I just spent a really long time looking very closely at a lot of small details. Now let's pull the camera back a bit and try to see the bigger picture. Let's take all the information we've looked at and combine it into a complete picture of Space Pirate Society and Culture. So here we go. The Space Pirates in individually are surprisingly human. They are sentient, intelligent, and emotional beings. They need rest. They need military leave. They raise pets as companions. They are sometimes lazy and disobedient. They do not always follow orders. They augment their bodies with invasive cybernetics. They live in a hierarchical society where every individual has an assigned role. When they step out of line, out of their assigned role, they are harshly punished. They live in a ruthless society that that does not value individual life, so any individual space pirate's life is considered expendable. When you are a space pirate, you can be killed or disposed of or simply forgotten at any time. Space pirate society is rigidly hierarchical and ruthlessly bureaucratic. Everyone has an assigned place and they are expected to stay there. The rolling bureaucracy is unfeeling and uncaring. The well-being of individuals is inconsequential. All that matters is the mission. All that matters are results. Space Pirate Society is dominated by the military. Industry and science serve the military, and the military directs the progress of society. All major decisions are made by the military command. Culturally, Space Pirates care very little about art, music, or literature. They design their spaces to be functional and practical. There is no decoration, recreation, or comfort to be found in their architecture. Space Pirate culture is dominated by the military and by science. Their heroes seem to be the soldiers who win their battles and the scientists who discover the technology that power the weapons their soldiers wield. There is an intrinsic insatiable curiosity at the center of space pirate culture. They want to know, they want to understand, to learn, to control everything around them. However, this curiosity is very narrow. They want to know about technology, about weapons, knowledge that will aid their mission of galactic conquest. 
knowledge irrelevant to this goal, like linguistics or history, is neglected. Research and experimentation are at the center of their domestic culture. When they aren't fighting, they are researching. Their research is often dangerous. They take extreme risks. They are willing to take almost any risk. This often results in disaster. However, no matter how often they fail, the space pirates always pick up the pieces and try again. There is an optimism at the core of space pirate culture, a belief in themselves, and a belief that ultimately they will succeed. This cultural optimism makes them a tenacious opponent. No matter how many times you beat them, they just don't give up. Because deep down, they don't believe they can fail. The space pirates hate, fear, and respect Samus, who they call the Hunter. They don't really understand her or her motivations. They don't know who she is, except that she's powerful, dangerous, and their enemy. Their ultimate goal is domination. It's not really clear why or what they would do with the galaxy if they actually did gain control, but there is no doubt that a space pirate dominated galaxy would be a terrible place. Their ruthlessness, lack of compassion, and total disregard for the value of life makes theirs a frightening and dangerous intergalactic empire. The writers and developers of Metroid Prime took these wall-crawling, laser-shooting lobster sprites from Super Metroid and transformed them into a defined and layered alien culture. It's really impressive work. But this is just Metroid Prime. The Space Pirate story continues in Metroid Prime 2, and so will my analysis, eventually. I will examine how the depiction of Space Pirate culture and society develops and changes over the course of the series.